Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to helping business owners prepare their business for exit so that you can maximize its valuation and exit on your own terms. This is the Exit Insights podcast and it's presented by Succession Plus. I'm Daryl Bates Brownsword and today I'm joined by David Pierce. David's got a fantastic uh, uh, business history and story to share with us and it's specific to the dental practice. So I was pretty keen to get David involved because it's not a story we hear before or well, that we've heard, I've heard before, and and it's a unique niche. So thanks for joining me, David. Hey, my pleasure, Daryl. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invite. Hey, my pleasure. Now, why don't you give us a bit of background um, when we say you're a specialist in, in the, the dental uh, practice industry? I'm guessing you've got a couple of years behind you. Yeah, the gray hair gives it away, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, so I mean, the quick story would be, you know, dental school, bought a practice uh, in the state of New Hampshire, um, and then uh, for family reasons, uh, had to sell that when it was just getting started, new building, so sold that, uh, moved to the state of New York where my wife is from, and started again, bought, a pra- bought into a practice there, uh, had some expectations on both sides that didn't get met, so it was a friendly departure from there, uh, bought another business, basically scratch. And then 10x that over the next 25 years, sold that practice in 2021, exited New York State. And now my wife and I live in Florida and Montana, back and forth between two places there. Uh, I begin part of this year, I actually middle end of, sorry, middle of last year, I started a, a coaching dentist business on the dent, on the business side of dentistry, not the clinical side of dentistry, but on the business side, just because I felt like like I could offer a lot of value to dentists, not it, this is a great topic today on transition because I've been through that um, and have watched other folks my age go through it and sometimes not so pretty. Um, and then I wrote a couple of books earlier this year, both on, on that subject and as well as uh, wealth accumulation through that business process. So uh, that's kind of like uh, age, age 20 to 65 in a nutshell. That's a whirlwind tour. So, yes. so let, let's just extract a couple of things. Yep. In, in the younger year, well, younger years, that seems unfair, doesn't it? No, it's okay. At the beginning of your career, let's, uh, let's <laughs> phrase it uh, in a much more polite way. At the beginning yeah, yeah. of your career, you, you bought and sold a couple of um, practices and one of them you got out of because of you know, the, 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 the two owners weren't aligned. Um, right. so, so you bought and sold. So can I ask how you valued those practices and, and how the, the owners or founders valued the practices and, and how you came up with a, an agreed value, and especially for when you exited as well. Because the, the reason I'm asking is because even though we're talking specifically about dental practices today, already what you've shared with us is a common story amongst business owners and entrepreneurs in almost any discipline, any professional expertise or, or any ownership. So how, how did you value the, the businesses that you bought into uh, in the beginning? Yeah, that's a great question. And of course, the age old line is so true, you know, it's worth what you can get for it. So sure. valuations are are awesome. But end of the day, it's like, how much is somebody going to write a check for? Uh, so the first business is, I would say, in so 30 years ago, I sold my first business. And that at that time, the idea of corporate dentistry, somebody who's going to have a much inflated valuation, because they're going to package it with other businesses, and it's all part of it of that corporate valuation structure didn't exist. And so yeah. that's an entity today that is exercised that didn't happen then. So for somebody who's, who's going this to traditional route 30 years ago versus now, it, that I would say the typical valuation is based on a, on a number of different factors. But if you throw all those aside and say, so what's the real number? It's probably somewhere in the 65 to 85% of revenue over the last 12 months. So it's based on initial revenue. And then that's, played around with, like for instance, my last business that I sold, it had become in a very good way, a very niche type dental business, which was tremendous as a business, but it was in a a geographic area, which wasn't, how would I say, not a destination location. Uh, And the niche was tougher for us to find an individual or individuals to come in and take over in an area that they might not want to live in so it'd have to be kind of a local type entity that was going to purchase it as opposed to you know like for instance where i am now in florida or montana i could easily get somebody to to 
move to either of those locations to purchase a, a niche practice if that's what they're looking for. But okay. so that's a, that's a really consideration that people told me about, but I didn't factor it into that. So, so there's yeah. a general rule in the marketplace, shall we say, an accepted principle that that a yes. practice when we're talking about a traditional dental practice, it's probably you know, just a small small business, literally. Um, 60 to 85 percent of revenue is the way that they're 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 valued is that right sure okay and and before we take it any further are there any restrictions on who can own a dental practice it's state by state but most states would say the owner has to be a dentist or, right. or so, one or one of the owners has to be a dentist yeah so just checking in for the entrepreneurs who may be listening and going hang on a sec i might be able to buy a couple of dental practices and um yes um and leverage up and 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 get an opportunity here. So one of the owners has to be a, a dentist and, and with all of the, the licenses and, and practice certificates and what have you. <clears throat> yeah, correct, yeah. And in reality, that's very easy to do for the entrepreneurial business people that might be listening uh, because there's many dentists that would say, I, I don't wanna run the business anymore, I just wanna practice. Well, good, you yep. sell it to us, we put you on as the PC for the state and we're good to go. Okay, and you mentioned earlier as well, David, that. Um, you, you, saw, you almost just slipped it in and said, look, you know, the traditional dentist practices are, are 60 to 85% of revenue. And that's got nothing. You know, that's before these corporate things came in. So it's a, it, what I'm hearing is in the dental um, industry, it's a similar strategy to buy up several practices and, and, and next door products or next door services and, and, and bolt them together. So you've now got a much bigger entity and a bigger entity by definition, the valuation formula changes and primarily because that's the risk um, associated with buying that changes and, and the market of potential buyers increases significantly. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and EBITDA you know, comes into play much more and all sorts of typical corporate valuation structures and mechanisms come into play. Yeah, so when you've just got a smaller practice, it's much like any smaller business. The only potential buyers realistically are your competitors. I think you said, you know, if it's a geographical location, it has to be another dentist typically who lives in that neighborhood and wants to buy a job close by and lives in the neighborhood, it has a geographic and picks up a, a, a general dental practice. Once you've got a suite of practices, you, you might have um, uh, an establishment in a number of suburbs or a number of locations around a city. And now you've got a you know, bordering on a franchise or, or, or conglomerate even. <clears throat> yeah, that's very, that's accurate, yes. And, and I think historically, maybe even historically up to date, dentists seem to be more sole individual, yep. sole proprietorships. I mean, they might be incorporated or whatever, but it's, it's, you, it'd be unusual to find a physician, for instance, who operates by themselves. On the other hand, it's very common to find, you know, one or two dentists, a dentist working by themselves or they're partnered with another person, but they don't have five, six, eight, 10, 12 dentists under the same roof in, in the same entity. Uh, okay. They just like, they really think are, differently about things. They're really quite small businesses. And, and so, so what we're hearing now that most of these, well, and like a lot of professions, you know, they didn't teach us how to run a business when we went to uni or med school or, or law school or whatever. They taught us how to be technically competent at our, our vocation. <clears throat> so if they're really that a micro business, it sounds like they're, they're like most practices where it's really just, you know, the owner and a couple of helpers. And, and that really is a definition of being self-employed. They may have a business entity that they own or, or a, uh, an incorporated business, but if it really is just them, it really is, you know, self-employed, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, it operates just like a sole proprietorship, whether it's a, an S-Corp or an LLC, you know, that's or for tax reasons and so forth. But yeah, it operates like a sole proprietorship. Okay, so we've got the foundations now and we've got the lay of the land for all those who aren't dentists. You bought and sold a couple early on and then, and then you uh, landed on your feet, I think, if I'm reading between the lines, and, and you bought one, and then you increased it tenfold over a number of years. That's correct. How, how was that journey? What, what, you know, did you have a book, you know, a, a handbook, a playbook that you just followed, and it said, you know, year one, do this, and year two, do this, and you follow these six steps, and hey, presto, <laughs> you've uh, 10 x your business. Yeah, that's all there was to it. That's it, Daryl, you got it. Beautiful. <laughs> next next really question. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so actually that's really why I'm coaching today because I didn't, there, is, there isn't that out there, you know, and it's really, it's really hard because everything you just said is, is so true that, and, and I think that, you know, the, the 
the thing about dentistry is that being a dentist has a liability liability built into it, which is you can, by virtue of that degree, you're going to have enough demand, my word, that you'll probably make enough money that you'll get by. Uh, you know, banks like number one, number two, who they're going to loan to are dentists because they just rarely go out of business. So you don't have to be good at the business part. You don't have to be good at the marketing, sales, all that stuff to keep the doors open. Um, but on the other hand, I've seen lots of dentists who just, you know, they're like, when it comes to retirement, they don't, their lifestyle is going to plummet. They just don't, never, never made enough money or saved enough money to have a retirement. So for me, I was interested in the business part one, and I was interested in, in more advanced dentistry. So over that period of time, maybe the first 15 years or so, I thought the way to make my business successful was become a master of the clinical part. So I dove into, you know, all the extra stuff and all the surgeries and all the full mouth stuff and what have you. And that was a piece of the puzzle, but it wasn't the puzzle because you still got to get people that say yes to what you're, you're offering at these high ticket items. Um, and that's what kind of where I, I hit a wall, which was all the people around me were knew the same stuff. But then when you ask them, so you're doing this all day long, right? And he's like, no, rarely. I'm just doing the same stuff the regular guy down the street is doing. And it was frustrating, you know. So there is just really, is, you know, there wasn't that coaching type person that I wish I had had in my life because uh, that would have made it so much faster, you know, to get where I got. Um, so it was like, you know, reading books, try this, <clears throat> sweat a lot, you know, try things that didn't work, um, reach out to some people that had some success and incorporate that and pick in pieces and, so, uh, yeah, it was a soul hall. It wasn't very pretty. Um, but then at this other point, you know, somewhere around age early 50s, when I figured it out, things just skyrocketed. You know, I mean, the, the business tripled, the personal revenue quadrupled. Uh, you know, we went from average to way above average. And and, uh, and it seems a shame that it took so friggin' long <laughs> to get there. So everyone who's listening is going, yeah, look, I don't care about what he did that didn't work. What happened in his early 50s? What was the magic thing that was so fundamentally different that he tried then uh, that, that, that made the, the significant difference? Yeah, and it's all on the business side, Daryl. I mean, you know, this, and this is where this business is no different than any other. You know, David was a very poor leader. I had no idea what leadership looked like. Uh, you know, I almost thought, uh, I mean, at the same time, I was a very good parent, which when it came to being a parent or a friend to my kids, like that was easy. I'm, I'm a parent. I don't care if you like me or not. But in the office, it wasn't as easy as that for me, uh, not to be harsh on, on the team, but at the same point in time, it's like, here's how we're running it. Here's what I want. You know, here's our noble purpose. Uh, and so it was infrastructure. We didn't have that. Like you didn't, didn't need it per se, but we did. So once I realized that, it's like, this is a, I mean, it was a corporate entity, but it should run like a, like a well-oiled machine business. So, you know, set up an accountability chart and set up uh, beliefs and, and purposes of who you are put people in roles so they know what the roles are and make them accountable to those roles because they want to be. Um, and, and once we did all that and started putting that together and, and created, you know, more of a, of a leader, leader, and then leader type role rather than leader. And you tell me what to do leader type thing. That's where everything just took off because the, the team came together. Uh, you know, we set up a culture where they were going to grow. They did the heavy lifting on all that stuff. So I could just focus on just doing the clinical stuff, which I enjoyed and so forth. And, and I was overseeing it, but uh, that was really the magic of the whole thing uh, was that, that portion for sure. So it sounds like um, we got some structure into the business and yes. we're able to, you know, frameworks for, for operating things. So everyone knew exactly what was expected of them. Um, you know, what was within their scope and area of responsibility and what was outside their area of responsibility. So if something came up, they knew where to go and who to go to and how far they, they could go themselves before they had to get approval or ask questions. Exactly. And it also sounds like, you know, it's that classic, you know, we started off thinking, hey, look, I'm in a, a technically skilled area in my business, my industry. If if I'm technically the best and, and uh, do everything technically really well, then, then the clients will just come rolling in because they'll just hear how fast, fantastic we are technically and they'll just flock to the doors. And right. uh, you found out the hard way that didn't work. That's right. <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you figured that, that yes, we, the, the, the technical skills are just the cost of entry. We need, you know, they're a yep. prerequisite. We've got the technical skills. We're capable at, at doing all the things we need to do that, that say we do above our door, so to speak. 
you were running the business um, and and making enough money to, I think you were saying, to keep the doors open, but you know, reading between the lines, you couldn't afford to replace the door handles when you needed to. So <laughs> perhaps you weren't, you weren't bringing in enough money and saving up enough personal wealth outside of your business. You were just going through the motions. <clears throat> yes, sir. We've now we've now learned you know MBA 101 so to speak from from the playbook, um, and we we've put some structures in place. We started managing and leading and and inspiring the people who we were working with so that they knew what was expected of them. Um, systems, frameworks, procedures for efficiency. Did that come into the equation, David? Yeah, I think probably the biggest thing what it for us was that as as my skill set grew the type of dentistry we are capable capable of doing also changed a lot. So I think most people, they think of a dentist because this is what they've had done. Their personal experiences, you go to a dentist, they do a crown, they do a root canal, they do some fillings, you get your teeth cleaned. Uh, maybe they put an implant in cause you lost a tooth and that's it. So the dentistry that my skill set took us to is somebody who's totally, you know, where we use the word, they have a disability, like they cover their mouth up. They can't go out in public. They, they, they want to reinvent themselves after divorce, but they just can't like, they're just, I'm so embarrassed by their, by their, their appearance and the breath and the inability to eat that they really just have a huge disability. And so we were using that same mentality of how do you uh, sell a root canal or a crown to somebody and you're trying to sell them, you know, 35, 45, 65 plus thousand dollars worth of, of reconstructive dentistry, but it's a totally different process. Uh, you know, so we are trying to like, uh, I don't like the word run and gun, but like, that's kind of what a typical dentist does if they want to increase their revenue is they're going to see more people, same amount of dollars per person, but just run more people through the shop. And that, that doesn't apply if you're doing that's kind of like a high end niche type one. So we had to really just slow down the process, you know, no different than, you know, and, and really slow it down. Like, you know, I'd say somebody said, you know, they're going to go out and buy, buy a $60,000 car before they walk in. They already know what it's going to cost. They already know something about it. They've already, and it's not unusual to spend 60 grand on that car because they've kind of been prepped for it by the world, but to walk into a dentist and know you have some problems and so forth. And for a dentist to say, it's going to be, you know, 50, 60 grand. That's it. That just like, you can get run people away really fast. And I was very good at running people away. <laughs> until you know you figure out it's like this is a totally different process and uh but once we figured that you know slow it down spend more time with people give them a chance to give themselves permission to actually do this for themselves you know that i'm worth spending that money on me to do that okay. so what we're hearing in and i guess business terms is if our factory is a high margin uh low volume factory then we need a different sales process and a different mm -hmm. marketing process to get different clientele in that to, to a factory, our business factory, that's got a, a high volume, low margin process, which is the, the fundamentals and the bread and butter of yeah. dentistry in, in this scenario. So, you know, so there's the bread and butter stuff is everyone can do it. So it's almost a commodity. Um, you can get it on every suburban corner dental practice, so to speak, yeah. and therefore right. it's low margin work because it's a, it's a bit more competitive. Yes, now sir. you're in the high margin work. Well, it's high margin because it's less competitive and it's more value added. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yep, that's it. Okay. So, and so how did you, like, you know, you, you realize you were turning people away because you were basically scaring them with your, your old you know, sales process. <laughs> What did you learn? How did you figure out that, hey, sales, this sales thing and having conversations with my, my customers, my clients, it's, I've got to have a different conversation. Um, did, did you do some training? Did you, you know, read a book? Like, how did you find out? Yeah, yeah. so I, you know, I read a book. I, 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 I've always had coaches in my life, all different parts of my life. I mean, I call everybody a coach, whether it's for my relationship with my wife or if it's, it's uh, get better at golf. They're all just people t teaching me stuff that I don't know. And so one of the business coaches as well. So typically uh, the business coaches I'd had in the past had mostly focused on, you know, some of the team stuff, which is really super important. Um, and, and then one person in particular had said to me, you know, if you, if you want to do more of the dentistry that you're capable of, but aren't doing, then you need to, he just used the word, you need to slow down the sales process. And it didn't really give me a lot of like what that would look like. But that concept kind of rang 
true for me because I, you know, I read enough about sales bo- in sales books enough about you know how that process could look different um, and I guess you know part of it was how do I get in my own head like yes give myself permission to spend that much time at you know no dollars no guarantee um, and and then convince my team like no 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 this is good this is what we should be um, and uh, so I think that took a little bit of time to just you know, make that mental, that mindset shift in my own head. Like, no, that's the way to do it. But once you saw a little bit of traction that way, like, yeah, look at, you know, we spent time with that person and they wouldn't have said yes to themselves if we hadn't, then that just sort of add fuel to that fire for me. And especially for the team, you know, I think I came around faster than they did. Um, but from their standpoint, it's like, that's all they've known. Like they've never seen anybody slow down the process anywhere. I you know they've never bought a seventy thousand dollar car, so they don't know how that process gets really slowed down by the salespeople as everybody else, you know. So Okay. So you Does that you've, help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you you slow things down so it's it's not a rush, so you're not people aren't feeling rushed through the process, they're not feeling sold to, they're feeling like they're buying now rather than they're being sold to. And right they're seeing the value to their life of solving this problem effectively and the, and the problem being self-confidence or, or self-esteem of of not not liking their smile i guess sure right so a bit more uh, clarity so when you've increased the size of your business and you said you you, you increased the, the the revenue size of it did you increase the staff members by much no 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 same number of people same number of people, so it's all that revenue is is extra profit and an extra premium on the on the products effectively or, or the the services that you're you're providing um, to your customers. Yeah, yeah, because I, th- I think really, I mean, you typically, you know, at some point you need more producers, assistants, hygienists, that kind of stuff, dentists. Um, but a lot of offices they just need more admin people because you have all this flow, so you have just that many more you know, things you have to process, pieces of paper, insurance forms, all that kind of stuff. Uh, whereas if you, if you have way less people coming through and we didn't, but in some ways you could almost justify and say, well, you could outsource this, this, and this and reduce your payroll by a, a margin, a small margin, because you're just not running so many people through the place. Okay. So, so it's all premium products. So, so well done there. Build it up. Now it came time for you to exit your business you, you yeah. decided that it's time for you to move on. How did you how did you go by about that? And and I guess when it came to the valuation, how did that compare to the you know the point six to point eight five times revenue uh, valuation formula? Sure. Yes, yeah, so I really felt like the the way that I wanted to exit at, for the business sake, for the employees, and for revenue was to bring in another dentist who had some skill sets, wanted to learn what I was doing, mentor them for whatever, two or three years, and then they would have some ownership. And then I would, you know, gradually fade into uh, more than gradually, I would quickly fade into the, into the distance because because my wife and I did want to exit New York and they they would take over, excuse me, take over the reins. So, and that, that I would say is a very good method. That's not the method that I went because at the time that I was, I had actually found an individual. I, I spoke with an individual who would be per has been perfect situation. My daughter, was in the process of graduating from dental school and doing a residency. And her initial plan was to be out West where she is now, but she and her husband decided to move back East into our town, live there for a while. They ended up having two grandkids there. So, so I had an opportunity or I had to work with her for a period of maybe three or four years, something like that while she was there uh, and teach her what I knew and she could learn all that kind of stuff uh, or not do that and go strictly for a business move to bring some in that I could sell it to. Cause I knew I wouldn't sell it to her cause she was going to leave. And so that was an easy decision. Like the opportunity to work with my daughter for four years is just like, so awesome. It's like, of course I'm going to do that. You know? So about the time that she was leaving the practice had already been for sale, I knew she wasn't going to buy it. Uh, and so that, that best option, my word, uh, was, uh, easily thrown away because I wanted to work with her. Uh, so from there it was, it was into that, you know, we really got to a point, uh, so three years from the day I put it on the market, it sold. So for three years, that's what it just took to sell it in that environment, that kind of a practice in that, uh, non-destination location. Um, 
And so, you know, at, uh, during that time, the, you know, you can imagine, well, so at some point in time, it's, what are we going to do? Put the furniture, you know, and everything on the side of the road and walk away, you know, I mean, and, and so, uh, you know, one of, one of my, one of my, one of my takeaways for everybody here is like, don't count on the sale of your, of your small business. I think it applies to every small business as being the windfall for your, your retirement portfolio, because there's many reasons why that may not happen. Uh, right. some of which you can't predict and some of which you can, but I was just, that'd be my message. So, you know, for me, that was always true. It's like, you know, I, I was prepared, you know, the end of 2021, that if it didn't sell, like I was going to like, like, this is going to be a fire sale. I'm going to try to run it from afar, like all different things, were, but I'm not going to be there uh, very quickly. Um, so fortunately an entity came in, but it, you know, they also looked at it and said, well, here's the deal. Like, you know, we're not sure we can do all the stuff that you did to create the revenue. Um, you're not going to stay as long for a transition as we'd like because you've made your 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 life goals clear, which is you want to leave New York. We get that. So we're going to undervalue it, considerably undervalue it, you know, at about a third of what it was worth um, because that's basically what it's worth to us. And uh, so, you know, I had other friends that had similar size. You know, we were, uh, you know, two and a half, three million dollar revenue annual. And I had other friends that in that same situation who are more desirable places and were willing to stay on who, who received four or five mil for their, from a, an entity coming in to buy it and bundle it with others. Uh, you know, for me, I was, uh, you know, half a mil or three quarters of a mil. So, um, but on the other hand, you know, for us, it was, uh, you know, money's great. It's a great tool. You know, if someone wants to pay me money, I'm happy to take it. Um, but because of the other things we had done along the way to make her put ourselves in a, in a, a, a position where we didn't need that. It was icing on the cake. Then it was like, it was just that <clears throat> icing on the cake, no regrets, great decision. Okay. So you had managed, uh, over the years to extract enough money to do some, you know, uh, retirement savings to, to fund life after work. So you knew that, you know, whatever happened with the business, whatever you got for it was just icing on the cake to use your words. Um, which is a comfortable position to be in because many of these self-employed slash small business owners are only making enough day in, day out, and they don't take the time to um, take some savings out. And, right. and so they're always living on that knife edge, feeling a little stressed, feeling that I've got to keep working rather than I want to keep working. Right. Um, and, yeah, there's always that you know, uh, feeling inside that that can cause a little anxiety and stress and and therefore stress and anxiety for those around them so, yeah so true you know and i and i and of course i'm speaking about dentists but i i have to imagine it's true for a lot of uh professionals and other business owners as well but you know if you take a, a typical dentist you know so i go to college with some of my friends and then out of college they maybe they go to an mba or they go right into a job and so the day at that point they're earning money I go four more years of dental school where I didn't earn anything and have four years worth of debt. And then I go into a residency program of one to three years that pays very little. So I'm, you know, five, five minimum, six, seven years behind them in income. I racked up yep. another half a million dollars worth of debt, but somehow I feel like I should be driving the nice car like they are. I should be living in the nicer house like they are. And I think that you know, a lot of professionals get trapped into that and society maybe puts that pressure on, oh, well, you're an attorney, you're a CPA, you're a dentist, you're whatever. You should be living this kind of lifestyle and they, and they get sucked into that lifestyle and, and it just, it just tears them apart. They don't, they're not saving anything at all. They're just living way above their means and then hoping for this grand big balloon at the end. It's, <laughs> it's not yeah. a balloon. It's a bit of societal and peer pressure there. Yeah, I think so. I impact. So, so your key messages, if if I'm hearing, are, are make sure that you, you, know, you, you you save so that your your exit plan in, in the dental practice is 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 icing on the cake. Um, set yeah. yourself up so that you know because you know we, we've learned in in a previous episode around the that the difference in valuation between tangible assets and intangible assets. Right. If you have a fire sale, all you're selling are your tangible assets at at fire sale prices. So, so you're yeah. going to make pennies in the dollar of, of what, what the business is really worth because the real valuation of your business is in the intangible assets and the likelihood of that revenue being able to continue or that profit growth being able to continue after you move on. 
what the new owner said to you in this scenario is, look, at the, the, we have no guarantee of that because you're not going to be around to show us how to do that. Right. Um, so we just can't afford to value it at, at, you know, at, at what you're running it at. But you, you, you reach some sort of medium where you've gone, hey, look, I don't have the pressure to try and take a big uh, windfall out of this. I've been taking my windfall as I've been going, uh, yep. so to speak. <clears throat> yes, sir. Exactly right. Yeah. So, David, that's a couple of years ago now. What are yes. you doing now? Yeah. So after that exit, I always I always enjoyed the business side. The last maybe seven or eight years, I've been in a in a you know affectionately called like a mastermind group of about. 25, 30 dentists that's facilitated by a, a non-dentist uh, business person. And we meet quarterly. And in that group, it's basically like, here's what's going good, well in my practice and here's what isn't. And so can you guys help me out with answers, solutions, you know, better questions to get better answers of what I can do. And then every 90 days we reconvene and, you know, how'd you do and, and new and, you know, rinse and repeat. Um, so in those, I found like I enjoyed that process a lot. And, you know, the, the group was gracious about saying, like you, you, David, seem to have the ability to take a complex stuff. You listen, you ask great questions, you boil it down. Here's like, this seems like here's the issue. Here's, here's you know, one, two, three action steps you could go to get traction in that area. Um, so that was rewarding, mentally rewarding. And I said, I want to do something. I'm not, I knew I couldn't sit around and play golf you know, all day long or sit on the beach all day longer. I just knew that wouldn't fit me. Um, and I wanted to do something on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You know, I've always felt like I, like if I could help one dentist achieve what I was able to get to and, or, and go way beyond it and get there way faster, then that dentist is going to be changing lives of so many more patients than it would be otherwise. So, you know, for me, I could, you know, vicariously be helping lots of people just by helping individual dentists get way better at, at helping their patients. So, so I started a coaching business uh, about a year ago, uh, you know, created a, you know, five, 600 page manual to go along with that, wrote a couple of books in the earlier part of this year. And then now in the process of you know, adding some clients uh, in a very intense focused, uh, successful, but I'll be at part-time in a, in a time standpoint of my time. So I can enjoy, you know, all the pleasures of not having a, a brick and mortar place. Um, and at the same point, I feel like I'm really contributing to the, to the value of, uh, of dentist lives in the dental community in general. Okay. So it sounds like the uh, student has become the teacher and uh, the, yeah. the teacher has gotten around to writing that playbook that didn't exist when the, the student first started school. Yeah, that's, I love the way you said that. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. If I had had that and had somebody just to, you know, uh, hold, hold my feet to the fire once in a while when I needed it, uh, it'd be a, it'd been a different, uh, a different journey for sure. And so you're helping, I guess, a hand, if you if you're doing one-to-one, -one, you're helping a handful, a small number of dentists, um, you know, get there, learn, you know, what, what you learned over a lifetime, you're showing them as quick as you can so that you can have an impact, make an impact on their lives, help them right. improve the valuation of their business and, and increase their options of and financial freedom by the sounds of it. <clears throat> That's it. In a nutshell, you got it. Perfect. Brilliant. So if there's the nutshell, David, look, we, we've, we, we've scanned, I guess, a, a whole career there of, uh, of from learning at the very beginning to now helping others do what you did. And, and we've touched on a whole lot of topics and, and key things that you've learned throughout your journey. For anyone listening today, uh, you know, whether they be dentists or, or um, you know, just entrepreneurs in, in any you know, field, what, what's the key message you think is, is the most important takeaway from our conversation? Well, in the spirit you know, of transition, I would say that, that you really need to start thinking way in advance. I mean, certainly economics think way in advance. You know, I mean, like you know, when I'm coaching, uh, and I love to coach dentists like in the early 30s. So I would just look at them and say, like, here's a formula to figure out how much, you know, how much you're going to need at retirement based on when you think you're going to retire and how much you're spending now because it's going to get more expensive. So is, is, as you're thinking about retirement, one is what, is, what are the economics going to look like? You know, I can remember, Daryl, when I first sat down with a, with a financial planner, CPA, attorney type guy 15 years ago, he said, well, plan on retirement is spending 80% less than you're spending now. And, and what I noticed is on weekends and when I had a week off from work was I spent more. It's like, I got time. I'm not, I'm going to spend when I was working. It's like, I can't spend it. I can, I'm working. And so I, in my head said, nah, I think that's more like 120%, not 80. 
And then, uh, you know, and then five years ago, I met with the same guy and he said, we revamped that. Now we're saying it's 120 to 150 percent. And I said, yeah, that's exactly it. So plan on that. Like you need more than you think. One, two would be like, so personally, like, what are you going to do when, you know, like this is not, this is dentist. So that's fine. But what are you going to do when you're not the boss anymore? Like that ego, if there's ego attached to that, like, what does that look like? And all the things that you think now I'll have time to do this and this and this, those are going to go away really fast. You know, see my parents, spend more time with this, take care of that. That's going to disappear. And all of a sudden there's going to be that void. So make sure you're prepared for what that's going to look like. If you can play golf every day for the next 30 years, God bless you. But make sure you know what that is. Uh, and then maybe the third part is family stuff. You know, it's like, you know, I know some, I, mean, I've, I talked to a couple of couples I know where, where the, the, the guy and the woman in one case has left the office. Now they're home. And the spouse is saying like, like, who's this invader in my house? Like, I, you know, it's like, like you were never here before. Now you are like, we got to get this figured out. Or one person has, has decided to step back from their career. And now they're putting pressure on their spouse to step back because they want to travel. They want to do this. And the spouse is like, no, 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 no. This is, that was your deal, not mine. So really have yeah. all those conversations in place. So get clear. And it's, it sounds like it's a classic entrepreneurial thing. Entrepreneurs are very visionary. They need to know what's next so they can race there. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. Right. So pay attention to that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, David, look, I really appreciate you spending time and, and sharing your insights with us. We'll, we'll gather all of your um, contact data and put it with the show notes in case anyone wants to get in touch with you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Daryl. I really appreciate the opportunity. Love your show. It's awesome. It's great. <laughs>